Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Consulting with Authority. I am joined by a friend of mine, Holly Johnson. Uh, Don Holly Johnson is a speaker, coach, creator of the Wildly Successful Enterprises program, and author of the book, What CEOs Don't Know, Welcome to the Future of Working Together. The Wildly Successful Enterprises program is designed to quickly evolve organizational focus, structure, and mindset, sparking unprecedented results in performance. In her soon-to-be-released book, What CEOs Don't Know, Don Holly addresses the ineffectiveness of traditional business practices while recommending alternative practices for organizations to generate positive results. Uh, Holly, I'm really, really excited to have you here today. Uh, we just spent some time talking about your expertise and your insight, and I know you're going to be sharing a lot of value with our folks today and, and frankly, helping them understand what I'm coming to understand and believe is a really important do business uh, in today's world versus what would be a much more fun, not to mention a much more efficient and effective way to do business. And we'll talk about that in just a couple minutes. Uh, but first of all, thank you so much for being on. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Glad to have you here. Um, I'd love, if you don't mind, just to share, and you don't have to give us the, the, the full thesis of your background and your story, but I'd love to know a little bit about how you got to where you are and, and how you had this realization of, uh, of this, this truly a paradigm shift of how businesses need to do business. Tell, tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I mean, uh, without going through, yes, I was born and I was, you know, seven pounds, six ounces and without <laughs> that kind of detail, right? Right, right. But I was raised by very pragmatic individuals, right? And it had, and and then I was, you know, assessed early in school, and and they said, you know, here's the different areas that you should go into work. And engineering just stood out for me, and so I was on this mission that I was going to get an engineering degree. Mm -hmm. And I think like that inside of I like to design things not to fail, right? So that's my mindset is, and and so growing up in the world, I kept looking at it's like why do, why do humans make everything so complicated? I would do it like this. And then once I got my degree and started working professionally, which is in a big corporation, 50,000 employees, aerospace company, uh, I had the opportunity to actually not go into engineering, but to work in quality assurance. And I could see the whole organization. And I loved that because I'm a big picture thinker, a systems right. thinker. And so I could see how the whole organization was operating. And I transformed the whole supply chain in a year and a half. I had no supply chain expertise. I had very little aerospace expertise, <laughs> but I think systems processes and question, why are we making it so hard for people to get their jobs done? And as soon as you make it easy for people to apply their innate talents, then they're happy and they're far more productive, but you can create the processes and systems to make people more productive. And so I continued to, I moved out of aerospace and went into healthcare after my father suffered uh, a massive stroke from medical error. I was determined to go into healthcare and clean things up. Yeah. I yeah. met tons of resistance in healthcare. Uh, I was in all facets of healthcare from insurance to hospital systems to disease and case management. And I could go on, but clinics, and, and there's huge opportunity, but as I continued to go into other industries and banking and telecommunications and higher education, and I've now worked in every major industry and, and several sub-industries and uh, in every size organization from a startup to a Fortune 100, the big guys that have 300,000 plus employees, right? Mm -hmm. I recognize that with this mindset that I have of why can't we make it simpler to work together and make the world turn. And I came to realize that every single organization I went into had all the same common problems. Gotcha. Gotcha. And that's kind of where I wanted to go next. So thank you for kind of getting us up to speed there. You know, you talk about this again, I'll use the phrase again, but this paradigm shift from a traditional business to I'll use your phrase wildly successful enterprises um, mm -hmm. Can you define maybe the differences uh, between what a traditional business is in terms of what we're talking about with you and your scope and what a wildly successful enterprise? Maybe just sort of draw the contrast between what you're what you're describing. Absolutely. So we see it every day. Uh, I think people have become somewhat numb to what's going on. But what are we seeing every day in the business world? We're seeing downsizing. 
Mm-hmm. Right? Downsizing and layoffs, reorganizations. And I think the larger the organization, people experience sometimes four reorganizations a year. Wow. Okay. So wow. the cheese is constantly moving. Right. right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, budget cutting is the norm now. So we'll set up, we'll spend a year creating the budget and then we'll start whacking at it because we're not hitting the, our levels of performance. Most organizations are not hitting their goals year after year after year. Mm-hmm. Well, why is that? But yet we all keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result, right? Yeah. So in traditional thinking, and it, and it is a societal paradigm, we're all born into it. Took me 20 years to realize after all this experience, because I was brought into organizations to have the entire organization perform better, which is not most people's jobs, right? right. It was my yeah. job to come in and I made billions of dollars in change. Most of it, I created revenue, more revenue coming in. Five billion of it was new revenue wow. simply because I made the organization perform so much better that customers were happier and they bought more right? They just bought more programs, bought more whatever. So the traditional way of thinking has become so ingrained. It started with the old accounting practices. And to this day, traditional organizations are driven first and foremost. I sometimes wonder who's in charge, the CFO or the CEO, quite frankly. Sometimes. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay? But it's really maybe a balanced you know, mentality, you know, right? Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, the focus is keep manipulating that balance sheet so it looks good. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying equity isn't important in a business, but it's if you're solely focused on this, then when you've got to make the next quarterly report look good, you're going to downsize, you're going to budget cut, you're going to right manipulate the numbers right to make the business look like it's performing well. But what you're missing is what's actually creating cash flow in your business. Mm -hmm. It's not manipulating the numbers constantly. In fact, the financials are latent measures that tell you nothing about what's working well or not working well in your business. It just says where you are financially. In that moment. Yeah. In that moment. Well, a few months ago. Right. 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 (laughs) And, and so it, I hate to say it, but it really doesn't mean much. Yeah, right. It because it's not a real much. time. It's not a real time measure, and it's not measuring something that we can depend on. Because, like you said, there's all this manipulation that can be done to make the right. numbers look better for you know the shareholders or or whoever the powers that be happen to be. Right, and yeah. if you look in what's what does immediate power does a CEO or CFO have? And it is to either tell everybody to go sell more, get more income coming in, income and expense statement, or cut expenses, right? Right. So that's what they go do, but that's not leading a business. Hmm. You're right. It's just, you're right. You're just playing with a math problem at that point. Exactly. And so you continue Hmm. to see this, this, what I call highly (laughs) underperforming businesses, they're not, I mean, I can see their maximum potential and they're not close to it. Mm. And, and we're all born in this paradigm. So I want everybody to understand, I'm not making you wrong about this. It's just, you don't know what you don't know. It's like when you first learn to ride a bicycle. Yeah. You don't know what balance is. Not on a bike. That's, no right. Idea. Yeah. That's right. You don't even know the feeling of that. Right. And you get on a bike and you might be, you know, a little afraid, but mom or dad's got the back of it. And you're like, oh, my God. Right. But, you know, because you've seen other people ride a bike and you're like, I want to be able to do that. Yeah. And, and, And so, unfortunately, everyone's in this traditional paradigm and they can't even see that there's an opportunity to ride a bike. Gotcha. That's interesting. But once you get on that bike, you get balance in an instant. Like all of a sudden you have it and then you never lose it. Right. Right. You can go without riding a bike for 20 years, get on one, just ride. You got balance. No problem. Yeah. That's what, you know, that's why I call this a transformational program because the moment you get balance, you're going to go, Whoa, 
And so what's been missed? So there's a lot of experts out there saying, go do this, go do that, go do this. I don't disagree with these approaches. In fact, many best practices have been around for decades, but yet mainstream hasn't adopted them because they don't know they can ride the bike. Yeah. They don't know. So, so the opportunity in what I wrote in the book and in the program is to actually get everyone through the transformative process of realizing that this is what you're doing. So some of the examples that I've given, right, you're manipulating balance sheets. What's that got to do with you delivering value to the world? Nothing. nothing. Effect- effectively nothing. Yeah. The business was formed to deliver something to the world. Mm-hmm. And you're busy manipulating the balance sheet. So it's an example, but it's become normal. Most organizations, people really aren't happy with their work. They're not. They don't feel fully fulfilled. Yeah. Some are quite miserable. And why is that? I mean, because they don't get to add that value. They're fighting the bureaucracy of the constant manipulation of the organization to make more money. Yeah. So focus is one of the three pillars I address. It's like, let's transform this. Well, The key thing in the whole first part of my book is I bring people to all these practices that they are doing today and have them actually consciously realize that they bought into this stuff. I mean, it took me 20 years to recognize that I had been raised in it and I had bought into it. Yeah. And I I kept wondering why I got all this resistance to change in these organizations, even though I brought amazing results, that the resistance was palpable. Yeah. And I'm like, why? Why wouldn't you want to improve the health of your organization? and the people in it. Why wouldn't you want that? But complete resistance. But it, I'm, I was selling a bicycle. And, and they had no experience with a bicycle, how to ride it, or what it could mean for them when they were able to, just to continue the metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. And if you think about it, most organi- when I say they're underperforming, they're walking. And if, if I need to go five miles to a store, and I have walking or taking a bicycle, which right. would you choose? No, of course, right? Absolutely. Far more efficient and effective, right? Yeah. And I can carry more. I mean, <laughs> you know, so it just yeah. makes sense. You know, it's a great metaphor. And so just having people, because, you know, you don't have a choice until you know there's a better way. This is, this is, that's such a huge point. That's such a huge point. And I can't tell you, I know you probably had experiences like this too, where I'm speaking with a client large, small, doesn't matter the shape, doesn't matter the industry, but you'll you'll be talking to them about what they think their problem is, yes. right? what they think their challenge is. And then yes. just with a little bit of education, transformation, to, to use your word, they realize, oh, I didn't even know, I didn't even know there was a solution to that problem. So I didn't perceive it as a problem anymore, right? Correct. The status quo has become so ingrained in business and individuals that a lot of us, I'll include myself in that world, right? For some things, I don't even perceive the problem anymore because I didn't realize there was even a solution. So that's a, a, I didn't mean to interrupt, but that's a really important insight. I think. We become numb to the status quo and just accept it. And, and, and so, you know, I would run into people that had brilliant ideas and organizations. I'm like, why don't you present it? But they knew they were just going to get shot down or or their idea stolen, which I've had several times yeah. happen yeah. to me. But it's a, co- a cultural uh, issue is in part what is causing the inertia of the status quo to be so great is that there may be there may be champions and disruptors that want to want to transform, but they're not enabled to. It's it's misaligned with how the business is traditionally operated, so forth. That's really fascinating to me. It's it's a big river to swim upstream in. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And after 20 years, I became exhausted from fighting that current. Right. And I started writing the book, started to think about what is it that people don't see? Because these are smart people. Right. Most people want to go to work, do a great job, enjoy what they do, bring their talents, right? Bring their, their, you know, it's like when people actually are allowed to do that, it, it creates such an amazing space. And some CEOs are recognizing that empowering their workforce is going a long way to creating huge leaps in productivity and of course it will improve cash flow and you name it and that's one pillar yeah, of what I'm yeah. talking about okay. so they're still missing two other areas <laughs> and can you <laughs> to transform can you maybe briefly touch on those two areas and kind of give us a description for for those because I mean the first one in my experience working with clients and 
you know, I'll indict myself a little bit, right? I, I fall into those those challenges as well. But what are the other two? Absolutely. So the first was focus, right? right. Stop focusing on the balance sheet. Focus on delivering some value. Yep. And the money will come. Not a problem. Yep. Number two is the structure. Okay. So I got to tell you, I've come to realize that we humans like to let things organically grow. So as our businesses grow, what do we do? We just start adding more people because, you know, the marketing department is now overwhelmed with keeping up with all the social media channels and whatever. So they bring in another social media expert or uh, operations, right? Uh, let's say we're making a widget. They're, they're trying to produce widgets and they, and they need more assemblers. And so they hire more of those. And so we let the organization grow organically. When it was first formed, it was a tight knit group that communicated well. And essentially everybody was working on, on that value delivery flow together. Right. And then what right. happened is, is each of those experts, and this is a big fallacy, by the way, is that experts know how to run a business So if you're a functional expert, like you're awesome at accounting and eventually become the CFO means nothing that you can create amazing financial processes, nor does it mean that you know how to run a business efficiently and effectively. It means you're good at accounting and that's fine. We need accountants, but (laughs) as an example, but it's not so, so these experts now hire other experts inside all these different groups. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Again, the focus is not on delivering value. It's managing people in expertise groups. That's what we focus on. Gotcha. Gotcha. The structure ends up like your typical org chart. You get the CMO and the COO and the da-da-da and da-da-da. And they each have their worlds. Right. And they each have their own goals, which might conflict, actually, with somebody else's goals. Often And then in a vacuum, they will sit and figure out with their department how they're going to make their department do these amazing Mm -hmm. things, which is totally disconnected from everyone else. Now, why would you build a business that way? Because you because of the status quo, you don't know another way, right? You just you're following the leader. That's why, right? There was never anyone back in the turn of I call it the industrial revolution when businesses started getting bigger, right? And and, Right. right, right, weren't just the mom and pop shop. Mm-hmm. cabinet maker guy or whatever, right? It like became big business. That's right. And nobody sat down and thought, well, how do you, so this is where the design engineering comes in. How do you design a business right. to actually work effectively and efficiently and create a joyful culture? Well, there is a way, but it's not the way we grew up. Yeah. Nobody yeah. sat down and said, this is the best way, but the status quo assumes it's the way, it's the only way we have to, we're stuck with it. So you, we do restructure an organization to into a much simpler structure that allows for them to actually deliver value and collaborate. It's it's amazing. People love it, but uh, you have to get them there and recognize it. Okay. And then the third, the third pillar is mindset, which has got to be integral. It, it seems like these things are sort of they build on one another, right? Because if the mindset, they do. Uh, if the mindset isn't there, there's no way you can do the structural change. And if the structural change doesn't happen, then you, you don't have the, the ability to refocus from the balance sheet to real world value. So these things are all, I guess you could think about them in a silo, but you, if you want to really transform your business into wild, one that's wildly successful, you, it's all three. It's got to be, uh, uh, it's got to be all three. And most, offerings out there to improve business performance focus on one of them okay and so uh back to the expertise thing as people become experts at a particular thing well i'm way up here looking at the whole organization going no no, we can just design it so it all works so all these common problems that are being experienced poor employee alignment poor strategy execution Weak cash flow or unreliable or unpredictable is the big word, right? Unpredictable cash flow, profitability, productivity, managing scalable growth, customer acquisition, customer retention. We solve all of it just by transforming the organization. So the third is the mindset, which is empowerment's important, but you have to control So I'm talking about creating a very nimble, very adaptable, very future-focused organization that can actually take on digital transformation. Digital transformation is going to be a train wreck unless people transform their organization. 
expectations from the traditional. We're already seeing that. Train wreck. Yeah. So it, total train wreck. I've been watching it for years going, I could stop this train, but the mindset needs to go from just fixing stuff real quick. And like you said, people, if they experience what they call a problem, we're natural problem solvers as human beings, and we just want to fix it in our world. That's right. Okay. But the issue is, is I don't have the mindset of the whole organization. I have the mindset of my area and I'm going to maybe do what I think is best, but it might not be best for the whole organization, the change I'm about to make. And so there needs to be some control around creating step change is what I call it into the organization. So the, the first is focus. You've got to start focusing on value mm-hmm. or you're dead in the water. And, and if an organization isn't at, doesn't have a strong value proposition, then none of the rest of this matters because you just don't have a valuable offering for the world. So it starts with focus. Sure. And then you have to st- structure it actually so that everyone's focused on delivering that value, mm-hmm. which they're not in these hierarchical. And, and then people say, well, I have a flatter organization. You're still in a hierarchy. You're still missing a critical dimension mm-hmm. of focus in the business. We focus on people and technology. Right. And the reason my company is called 3D Value Group is because there's this whole third dimension that gets missed. Gotcha. And and so uh, when you start focusing on that, then everything starts delivering. And then the mindset needs to be, now, how are you going to make that sustainable and keep continuously improving it? This right. is where people might have heard of operational excellence. I mm-hmm. touch on operational excellence, but also two other practices that all come together that help keep that delivery flow working optimally and allowing everybody to collaborate and and improve it versus just quickly fixing it. Because I give the analogy of this. If your organization had to deliver uh, a frequency of 107.5 FM Mm -hmm. and every person in the organization had a dial where they could change the frequency, which is happening every day in organizations, by the way, Mm -hmm. people are changing how they're working based on what they perceive as a problem, which is usually effect, an effect yeah. of a bigger yeah. problem upstream or somewhere else in the organization, but they see it as a problem. So they're working on the effect, not the real problem. And they will change and manipulate it. So it's like everybody's got little dials to the radio. You're never delivering 107.5. Right. I got you. It's all, not it's going all noise. To not going to. So the mindset needs to be, so it's, it's literally showing people that there's a whole nother way to approach how to continuously improve an organization mm-hmm. and to manage the efforts, the projects um, and everything going on in the organization such that everyone stays focused yeah. on the end game. Right. Okay. Gotcha. And so I would assume that mindset piece, then, if you're talking about transforming an organization into this new model, that mindset piece underlies everything else and speaks directly to the nature and culture of that organization in terms of that this is how the big people, cultural shift. Yes. How, how people see themselves, how people see themselves within the context of the organization. Am I truly important? Am I not important? Am, am, are my, am I perceiving my subordinates to be as important as they are or am I not? I, all of these things up and down the line or across the organization, uh, that mindset piece has got to be, I don't want to say it's a linchpin because all of these three are critical, but without that, you, you could try to do everything else, but without that cultural shift, everything's going to fall apart, right? You might have it together for a moment, but it's going to implode. Yes, but without first getting the focus right and the structure right, you don't have a hope and heck of changing mindset. But most okay. effort is focused on the mindset piece, which is Understood. the last thing I address. Yeah. Because it, so you're 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 trying to fix something where the root cause is not being affected whatsoever. I see. I see. And it drives the wrong mindset. The wrong focus and wrong structure drives all the wrong mindset. Well, we have drives to, we have to, we have drives to have politics. Drives nepotism. Yeah. Quick fixing, it, it drives a platitude of problems in organizations. And so every person in the organization is valuable in right. the new, right. in the future focused organization I propose. And by the way, this is a one-time transformation because 
what I recommend is timeless. It will never fail. I don't care what they invent in the future. There will not be another need to change the organization again. As long as there's humanity, it will apply, right? It's timeless. Yeah. It's a timeless, but it's it's a it's a it's a paradigm people can't see and therefore they haven't thought it important even when it's been presented or been able to appreciate or understand it. Yeah. And that's why the book a good chunk of it is is getting people to even see that there's a bicycle. Yeah. And then I take them through what to do. Yeah. This has been fantastic. And I think it's a great overview of what you do, your expertise, and how you're affecting change for, for large enterprises. One question I always ask, and I would love to hear your response to it, and I no doubt it'll be related, and you may have already told us, but you can give us more context if you would. Most valuable lesson learned from your career, your experience, and it can be recent, not recent. It can be over the span. It could be something tactical or strategic or both. You're not limited to one thing. The biggest lesson or lessons learned maybe over your career of doing what you've done? Well, expertise isn't everything, I would say. Okay. I, I talk about this in the book, mm-hmm. uh, but we have this uh, flawed assumption mm-hmm. that just because someone's an expert at something, quote unquote, they have a degree in something or 20 years experience in something makes it an expert at designing and operating a business. It's a complete fallacy. Yep. Uh, I mean, I... I see that time and time again, and I would expect that folks listening and watching this have the same experiences too. It's the Peter principle in action, right? Yes. People are promoted to their to their lowest level of incompetence. <laughs> Absolutely. And and so what's what's the impact of that? Well, I'm an expert at what I do, but I had to look at more than that, right? Because for 20 years, I did nothing but swim upstream in a very violent current, okay? Yeah. You hired me to bring amazing positive change, and now you're going to just fight me the whole time. Um, yeah, right. right? And, and so why is that? Well, so it's being able to understand all of it and bring in other experts in different areas and look at the all of it. And, and so I had to think about how can I bring people through without them having 25 years experience in transforming organizations? Mm-hmm. Very, and I'm a pragmatist, right? Like very easily. This is not a difficult book to read. No big <laughs> right. words. No yeah, big yeah. words. Okay? That's good for me. That's good <laughs> it's for me. It's just, I slowly get you, you know, it's the process I've got to take you through. Yeah. And that matters more because once this process, you are through it, you will understand it. Mm-hmm. And so you can have a bunch of experts, like let's say you can give a bunch of experts a, a bad recipe, like let's say a chef's award-winning chefs, give them a bad recipe. They're going to have to sit there and tweak the recipe. They're going to take longer. Cause it's like, well, well, why are they asking me to put this ingredient in it? There's no measurement for this ingredient. How much right. of that do I put in? But if I, if I write a perfect recipe, well-measured, very good description of this is how you beat the batter or this is how you write. And I walk people through that. I don't need an award-winning chef to make a killer meal. No, that's true. That's, that, that's a great metaphor. And so uh, your book is this new recipe going from the traditional status quo business model to a truly transformed business model that is truly bringing the value that it was meant to bring from the very beginning. And it can be done quickly and simply. It doesn't have to take years. It does, seriously. And see, that's that's uh, just one last note here uh, before we wrap. I think that's a really important note too. Is that we assume, uh, and I fall. I certainly fall into this camp way too often, where I will make the assumption, uh, or my clients will make the assumption, it, in order for something to be worthwhile, for us to get a worthwhile result or worthwhile value, it has to take long or it has to be difficult. And those things are not inherently true. Some things that are worthwhile and valuable may be difficult or may take a while, but that's just because it's difficult or takes a while doesn't mean there's automatic value. And just because there's value created doesn't mean it has to be difficult or take a long time. So I think that's a really fascinating point to remember because that, again, societally, we're not, that's not how we're taught. 
Yes, but I could walk to the store for five miles and lug home all these groceries, or I could just take my bicycle. Yeah, and it'd be a heck of a lot easier. And so that I I I think I even have that on the website. But it's like different does not mean difficult. They're not synonymous. Yeah, no, that's that's a great insight, Holly. Thank you so much for your time today and your insight. This has been fantastic. I have a page of notes from our conversation. I know we'll be talking again. Tell everybody, if they want to learn more about you and your firm, the book uh, coming out, tell them about how how can they engage you? How can they find you? Absolutely. Well, uh, if you want to sign up to uh, hear about the book release, uh, just go to donhollyjohnson.com. Okay. And uh, you can sign right up so you'll get a notification when the book's about to be released. We're not going to pelter you with emails. <laughs> and then wildlysuccessfulenterprises.com. Okay. where you can take a quick assessment about your business and, you know, kind of see where you're at compared to what I consider is the maximum potential that you have. You can also sign up for notifications of when uh, new articles and videos are coming out so that you can stay in the loop. That's awesome. So those two sites, again, were donhollyjohnson.com, D-A-W-N, Holly with an L, johnson.com, and then wildlysuccessfulenterprises.com. Did I get that right? Yeah, wildlysuccessfulenterprises.com and Perfect. then D A W N H O L L Y. Right. J O H N S O N. Perfect. Excellent. Well, again, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate you uh, making time for, for our listeners. And uh, I know that if you all were listening or watching, you got a lot of great value just like I did. Uh, thank you so much. And we'll look forward to having you again back with us sometime, Holly. Scott, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Be well. Thank you for listening. I hope you got a ton of value out of this episode. And before we go, I want to thank the sponsor of our show, Smart Solutions Media. Smart Solutions Media empowers business owners, consultants, and other independent professionals to easily attract better prospects and transform them into long-term clients. If you're a B2B consultant or service professional and would like to start filling your pipeline with better quality prospects, visit us on the web at smartsolutionsmedia.com to learn more about what we can do to help you. Be sure to complete this short two-minute accelerated growth scorecard you can find on the website and you'll receive a complimentary strategy session where we'll give you specific insights and recommendations to help you attract high-value clients. Until next time, make sure you are consulting with authority.